The Secret of Flight, a series of programs on aerodynamics. Program four, The Discovery of Dynamic Lift. Your host is Dr. Alexander Lippisch. In the previous lecture, we have talked about the invention of the airplane. And we were going through all the different stages of this development. We have seen that three major problems had to be brought to a solution. The first problem was the lift problem. That means to make with proper wings or any kind of surface enough lifting force so that we could carry the airplane aloft. The second problem was the problem of control. That means to design a certain system where we could keep the attitude of the aircraft in a proper position and go with the airplane according to the will of the pilot. The third problem was the problem of propulsion. This problem means that we have first an engine and on the other hand a propulsive system like propellers and other propulsive devices. And we have to invent and to design this. If we solve the three problems, we can build an aircraft. Now, they are certainly of equal importance, but you might admit that if we did not solve the problem of lift, the work on the two other problems wouldn't have been of much value. And therefore, since lift is a major problem of aircraft invention, we will talk at the present time about the dynamic lift. Now, we know not much about any activity in the early times of history, and we have only a few sagas or something like this, which are true or not true. The only man who really was working on this problem in a more modern way was the great genius of the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci. And I will give you here some quotations from his books, which actually are a big volume, and we can only take a few remarks of this great genius of the Renaissance. The pressure exerted by the wings on the air is the same as the pressure of the air around the wing. Can't you see how the wings of the eagle striking the resistant air sustain his flights in the extremely thin air at high altitudes? You see how the wind over the ocean, repulsed by the full-blown sails, speeds up the heavily loaded vessel. From these proofs, you can conclude that man, too, will be able to master the resistance of the air. With large wings skillfully designed, he will exert the pressure on the air and master its motion so that he will be able to lift himself from the ground. The work of the great genius, Leonardo da Vinci, was lost. And when the Frenchman, Montgolfier, invented the balloon, the lighter than air, most people thought that this was the solution of human flight. It took 
quite a while until people had to realize that a balloon itself is certainly a very fine instrument for investigations, but it's not the solution of the human flight as we have it today. And physicists began again to search for the true source, the true source of the dynamic lift. The first instrument which was known to men, which would fly as a heavier than air, was the kite. We don't know exactly who invented it, but in the last centuries, the kite was used as an instrument for research in the atmosphere. Such kites were developed by the Australian Hargrave, and we have a little box kite here as a model in the wind tunnel and we can see how it flies. When I turn the wind on, the kite goes up. I turn it down, the kite falls down. There it is. Again turn it up and now if we introduce the smoke we can actually see how the flow around the kite behaves and why we get this lift. The lift force itself is indicated by the direction of the line which holds the kite. We see that a certain pressure on the surfaces of the kite gives this lift. We will see that even better if we only mount one flat plate into the tunnel. Now we have a flat plate in our smoke tunnel and we see that if we have no angle of attack, that means no angle between the plate and the flow line, we certainly have no lift. If we turn the plate up, we see that the flow is slowly deflected downwards and a lift results which is mainly created by pressure from underneath. If we turn it higher, we see very well that behind the plate on the upper surface, there is a dead air zone behind the plate, which comes out even more if we turn the smoke down and observe now when I start the tunnel again, as this. When we turn it more up, then a violent oscillations begin, a phenomenon which we will mention later in another lecture. This example was used of, from the famous scientist Helmholtz and Kirchhoff as the first example of explaining the lift, the dynamic lift on the flow of a flat plate. They took this example where we have here a dead air zone and the flow goes around like this. Now, it's obvious that if you disregard the friction forces, the pressure necessarily must act perpendicular to the plate and causes a lift force which is also perpendicular to the plate. If you resolve these forces in the resultant force, in a lift force, which is rectangular to the oncoming flow and a drag force which is in the direction, then you see that you can, from calculating the resultant force and knowing the angle, we can find the lift and the corresponding drag. From this theory, which I can explain here only very short, it was concluded that to fly a heavier than air, a considerable amount of power would be needed. When we take, for instance, an 800 pound aircraft with a man in it and a machine, and let's figure out, a man would probably weigh 200 pounds and we would have 
probably 200 pounds structure. Then we would need an engine of 400 pounds, which on the basis of the theory should develop 100 horsepower. Now, at this time of the theory and of this early development, which was 1870 around, nothing, no engine was known which would give so much power for just so few weight. Heavier than air will not fly. This was the conclusion of the theory. And if there wouldn't have been any independent thinkers who still searched for other means of dynamic lift, this probably could have been the death sentence of aviation. Among these were two young engineers who were lovers of birds and observed all kinds of birds and among them the big water birds, the storks, which gave them the possibility to see more clear what the action of the bird's wings would be. Now they tamed some and measured them. And so they came out that such bird which they had would weigh eight pounds. The bird. And the theory, as I explained it before to you, stated that we needed for each eight pounds one horsepower to fly. So this birdie should have actually one horsepower. Now it's obvious that this couldn't be because the natural horsepower weighs about 800 pounds. And if you think that a bird would have probably a more efficient muscular system and other advantages due to its smaller size, you could probably reduce this weight ratio of 1 to 100 into a weight ratio of 1 to 10, a power ratio of 1 to 10. Well, and you could conclude from such estimation that this bird would then have probably one-tenth of a horsepower for horizontal flight. That means the Lilienthal brothers concluded that natural flight was at least possible with 80 pounds per horsepower. Now there was no theory known at this time where you could derive such a thing. The only way to prove their point was again the way to do experiments with wings like the wings of birds. And there Lienthal built himself a kind of a whirling arm, which you see here in this picture. And there he measured first the straight wings, and then he began to measure cambered wings, that means wings which are hollow in its cross-section. This is straight and this is cambered. If you look at the bird, the bird doesn't have straight wings. The bird has cambered wings. That means they are hollow underneath and rounded above. And when you now observe in our smoke tunnel the flow on a cambered wing, you will see at once that this is so much more advantageous compared with the flat plate. The cambered wing guides 
the air over the upper surface very smoothly and we have no dead air zone above and behind the wing. When we now turn the angle of attack to higher values, then we see that the upper surface begins to stall, as we call it, and again the dead air zone, as we know it from the flat plate, develops. But when we turn the angle of attack down to zero, that means to a position where leading and trailing edge are at the same level, we see that still the deflection of the flow is there and we have lift. This was one point, one major point of Leenthal's investigations which showed that the original theory could not be right who explained the lift as pressure from underneath. The main lift must be the suction, the low pressure developed on the upper surface. And to prove this, he used a little simple gadget, a propeller or might be called a helicopter rotor, which is completely flat underneath and has a cambered surface above, a cross section like this. Now this can move in this or this direction and gives lift. So if I turn it here, you will see that without angle of attack, we have lift. Now watch this. He published all these tests and his observations on bird flight in a book. The bird flight as the basis of aviation. But even if a thorough investigation of his work would have shown that he discovered the real source of dynamic lift, nobody paid much attention to this publication at this time, which was 1888. He couldn't do much about it. And what did he do was to build the first man carrying, carrying heavier than air aircraft to build gliders with which he could fly from a hillside downwards gliding through the air with the power of gravitation like a sleigh on a hillside and measure the gliding angle, measure the speed and in this way establish the power which was necessary to carry such an aircraft in a horizontal course through the air. He didn't want to do only this. He wanted also to imitate the soaring flight of the birds on the upcurrent of a hillside. When you have here a hill and the wind is blowing against it, then you have an upcurrent. And in this upcurrent you could fly with your glider without losing any height. He tried this several times and improved his gliders and finally found that he needed more and more wind. And on one of his last tests, which he wanted to do with this machine, he went out in a strong wind and since he didn't care very much for the control of these gliders. He actually controlled them with shifting its own weight. He was caught by a strong gust, thrown up 100 feet in the air, lost control and dove to his death. Before he lost consciousness, he uttered the words, sacrifices must be made. How many courageous men have since, since this first accident on a test flight given their lives for the conquest of the air? On their sacrifice, our knowledge is built up. And scientific achievement is not only accomplished by the man on the desk 
and in the research laboratories, but by the heroes of aviation who paved the way for this new conquest of the air. The final theory of the dynamic lift of an airfoil was developed by the two scientists Kutta and Joukowsky. Kutta, a German, and Joukowsky, the father of the Russian aeronautical science. A modern wing section is never a thin cambered plate, but it is now a streamlined cambered plate to give space for the elements of construction which are in such a wing like the spars and other construction elements. You can easily imagine the shape of such section if you think that we first have a streamline like this, actually what we call today a symmetrical airfoil. And if we bend this, then we get a cambered airfoil like this. We have now installed one of those airfoils actually between this one and this one in our smoke tunnel. And here it is. You see, due to the rounding of the nose, the flow goes smooth over the surface. And even if we decrease, increase the angle of attack, it still holds on the upper surface. Our stalling point, which was originally much lower, is now put into higher angles of attack, which makes it possible to fly at largest, large speeds and low speeds. Well, the main lift, as we have seen it before, was the suction on the upper surface. And this is caused by a higher speed over the upper surface, which you can see here from the narrow streamlines. But you can see it much better on a high-speed movie, which we might show you now, which is made with so-called pulsating flow. That means we enter into the tunnel pulses of the smoke, which we interrupt periodically, and this timeline which goes now over the wing section shows us the difference in speed on the upper and the lower surface. I think this picture speaks for itself. The death of Otto Lilienthal caused many investigators to take up the search, the development of gliders and the further test of airfoils as proposed by the Intals. Among them were the two young Americans, the final inventors of the aircraft, the brothers Wilbur and Orville Wright from Dayton, Ohio. With great ingenuity, they tested gliders and they built themselves the wind tunnel and made in this first successful wind tunnel many experiments on different shapes of wings and airfoils. Unfortunately, these tests were not published until after the death of Orville Wright and are now composed in this big publication of the Smithsonian Institute, a very valuable book. At the time they tested this, the case Lienthal against scientific theory was not yet solved and they had to decide whether or not the tangential, the negative tangential force, as Lilienthal pointed it out, existed. What is it? 
See, the original theory pointed out that the force, the resultant force, is rectangular to the flat plate. So lift and drag can be calculated from this. Leenthal showed that the drag is much smaller than predicted by the theory. That means that his resultant force he measured is ahead in front of the perpendicular line which you draw towards the so-called chord of the section. Then when you resolve it, then you find that in this line of the chord is a force which points forward, the so-called negative tangential. Now, this is proved by the measurements, but to prove it to you here, I have a little simple experiment in this tunnel where we have a wing section on rails. And when I put the wind on, I turn the wind, then what happens? If the negative tangential exists, then this airfoil should run upwards on the rail against the wind. Now watch it. And there is a proof. If we have a little smoke, then we can even see it with the smoke lines, like this now. Well, this final proof of the tangential and the small tangential showed to the Wright brothers that it would be possible to design an aircraft which would carry a man. The famous flights of the Wright machine, December 1903, were made with a power loading of 63 pounds per horsepower. The next time we will talk about the control system of aircraft. And from the invention of the Wright brothers, we will go through the different systems until we show how a modern airplane is controlled. You have just seen the discovery of dynamic lift, the fourth in a series of programs explaining the secret of flight. Your host has been Dr. Alexander Lippisch, director of the Aeronautical Research Laboratories of the Collins Radio Company. This program was produced for the Educational Television and Radio Center by the State University of Iowa.